Welcome to this short webinar on the use of what many call e-learning as a viable pedagogy, both now during COVID-19 pandemic, as well as beyond this, into the new as of yet unframed world that is going to emerge from being locked up. My name is Karen Della, and I first want to start with a disclosure. I work for Chartal Business College and we are an online provider. I've been doing this for over five years now. I've learned a lot. I've battled. We've changed our business model. I've fought with regulators. I've been unpopular for pushing boundaries. I've learned that regulators generally don't like online learning, often because they can't control it. They question the veracity of online assessment and they often lack the pedagogical paradigm to understand it fully. But as country after country goes into lockdown from the COVID-19 pandemic, the number of providers of education at basic, secondary and tertiary levels who are switching to some form of online learning has definitely soared. However, the reality is that few of these institutions are well prepared for the sudden disruptive move. I see a lot of scrambling and a lot of improvisation as regulators, administrators, lecturers, facilitators, assessors, and even students struggle to implement various forms of online learning. I've been asked by the ASDSA to share some hints, lessons, and ideas for both SDFs grappling with how to advise their clients on online learning, as well as SDPs who are questioning whether and how to get online as quickly as they can so that they can save their businesses and remain trading. What I'm sharing is mostly from my own experience and my journey. As I said, Chartle started this journey from face to face to online about five years ago. It wasn't easy. It's taken us that long to convince clients, cajole students and reason with regulators as well as train our staff. You've got weeks if you want to do this. I hope that my lessons can help ease your way. I've divided my webinar into three segments. Each segment is about 10 minutes and I'm going to stop in between to take live questions. So in the first session, I'm going to provide an overview of online learning. So here I want to highlight some of the key terms, the pros and cons of doing online learning, etc. I guess this section is more for the SDFs who are advising clients on the switch from face-to-face -face learnerships and face-to-face -face short courses to a blended or even a fully online option. And yes, at Chartle we do full learnerships online, so it's certainly possible if your CETA is accommodating. In the second session, I want to explore the underlying pedagogy in the design of online learning. Now this session is obviously more for the skills development providers and I'm trying to stress that moving to online provision is not a matter of taking material developed for class delivery and somehow automatically putting it online and assuming that it's going to be fit for purpose. Learning online is different. It takes different skills, it's more individualistic and it's more exploratory. What we develop is more curation than spoon feeding and notes that are written to the ACs. After the QA session, linked to session three, I'm going to discuss if getting online is right for you and right for your learners and your clients. How do you go about it? And this is where I'm going to talk to the practicalities of the move from the synchronous class where the lecturer, the student are in the same place at the same time to the asynchronous class where the lecturer is teaching in a different place and a different time to that within which the student is actually learning or absorbing that content. And then I'll end as usual with a question and answer session. I want to start by addressing the definitive question that I'm asked all the time. Are we allowed to do online learning in South Africa? The reality is that many CETAs just don't like it. They don't want it, and many are outright anti for a number of reasons. At Chartal, we're fortunate enough to work with some really enlightened CETAs, particularly Bank CETA and FACET. 
but we also work with some who are grudging, shall we say, in their acceptance, and who have put up many false barriers to entry to the online world of training. One of these is ETDP CETA, who want a different accreditation if you want to do online learning, which is kind of weird because we've got an outcomes-based education system in South Africa. So how you get the outcome should be far less important than the fact that you can show competence. And then, of course, as many of you will know, there is Services CETA, where they have said we can do part of the learning online while they finish writing their policies, which they've been writing for about four years now, so time will tell. Let's start our journey towards understanding of is this allowed by looking at the white paper on post-school education, which really is the blueprint of the Department of Higher Education and Training for building an expanded, effective and integrated post-school system. The Minister of the DHET says of this document that it's, and I'm quoting, a definitive statement of the government's vision for the post-school system, outlearning our main priorities and our strategies for achieving them. It's a vision for an integrated system of post-school education and training with all institutions playing their role as parts of a coherent but differentiated whole. And look at that. There's a whole chapter, chapter seven, devoted to open learning through diverse modes of provision. So yes, according to this white paper, we can definitely do online learning. Quoting from page 48 in particular from the white paper, and I'm quoting here directly, e-learning caters for the very wide variety of potential student needs, including mature adult learners who have to study and work at the same time, as well as younger people who may have dropped out of the schooling system due to financial, social, learning or other barriers. It goes on to say such students require access not only to a diverse range of programs, but also to appropriate modes of provision, which take into account their varying life and work context rather than requiring them to attend daily classes at fixed times and central venues." Unquote. So that seems fairly definitive to me. DHEAD is saying we can do online learning. CHE also allows it, and Chartal is accredited as an online provider of higher education with the CHE. The CHE has got very strict criteria for accreditation. In fact, their Good Practice Guide on Distance Education, which they published in 2015, which includes online learning, is really worth reading if you're grappling with thoughts about how to retain quality as you move online. Oh, and the QCTO is not against online learning either, and their policy will re be released any day now, and it's wide ranging and it's supportive of the fact that learning can take place online. So it really is just a few dinosaur seaters that can't get their head around the fact that learning can take place in a variety of ways and that cramming 20 people into a stuffy classroom with one lecturer reading from a textbook is really not better than an immersive online learning experience. This is a little joke, of course, amended from the one doing the rounds on social media. So if we ask, so who forced the CETAs to recognize online learning? And it's a multiple choice question. Was it the chief technology officer, the chief learning officer? No, absolutely not. It was COVID-19. COVID-19 may just be the catalyst. We need to get greater recognition for online learning from our many regulators out there who were so resistant. And of course, part of me hopes that recognition of prior learning gets the same recognition. But hey, we can dream, right? I'd like to revisit a quote from Peter Drucker from, a long, from as long ago as 1997. Now, the management and HR guru Peter Drucker said, and I'm quoting, universities won't survive. The future is outside the traditional campus, outside the traditional classroom. Distance learning is coming on fast. And this really was before the explosion of the online, learn online learning paradigm in the World Wide Web. So for a long time, this move away from bricks and mortar education with a reliance on same space, same place has been touted to be about to change. Yet it hasn't really. 
it needed a big catalyst. And I think that COVID-19 is that big catalyst. More and more learning is now going to start going online. So let's start by getting on the same page with our terminology. If we all use the same terms, we'll have similar understanding and this just builds more trust. I chose to use online learning for this presentation as the concept because it is more broad than e-learning. In fact, online learning is more of a catch-all phrase that includes e-learning, which is electronic learning, obviously, m-learning, which is mobile learning, and the latest trend, which is u-learning. U-learning stands for ubiquitous, so it really refers to learning that is anywhere, anytime learning. And it really refers to any environment that allows any kind of mobile learning devices of any kind to access learning and teaching contexts via the wireless network. Other terms that you'll hear and start using are mixed modes or blended delivery methods. And now this is some class and some online, often in a, a flipped scenario. Now we say flipped because traditional classes have theory in the classroom and practical work as homework. But with the online learning environment, we flip this and we have the theory done online and practical work is then done face to face in a class or a simulated group setting. Another key term which you'll see is the difference between synchronous learning and asynchronous. And this refers to the spatial and time dimensions of the lecturer and the learner. Synchronous learning is learning where the lecturer and the student are engaged at the same time, such as in a, um, a Zoom e-lecture, for instance. Whereas asynchronous learning, the lecturer lectures and records in one time zone, and the le learner consumes it and learns in another time. Learning and teaching take place in different time zones and different places then. Other concepts to keep an eye out for things like gamification, which makes learning a game, and virtual and augmented reality, which allows for simulations in a, in a safe environment, like teaching pilots to fly in a simulator. We also have the concept that describes whether we're teaching one to many, such as a, an e-lecture with one lecturer and many, many students, and many-to-many -many scenarios where we have many facilitators and many students and learning and teaching is shared and peer-supported learning happens. You'll also hear about micro-learning, which is little bites of learning designed to deal with the modern and shortened attention span. You'll hear the concept Learner Content Management System or LCMS, although some people just say LMS. This is what you're going to need if you want to deliver and track online learning and assessment. At Chartle, we use the open source LCMS called Moodle, which is a good option to get up and running quickly and cheaply if you've got reasonable computer skills. You're also going to hear a lot about big data as you delve into online learning. And this is data which is generated by online materials, which are SCORM and Tin Can API compliant, which really just means that you can track students as they complete a byte of learning and you can transfer that data to another platform so that you can analyze it. So for example, if you've developed a course in PowerPoint, you can't see who's finished that course and you can't see what mark they got and you can't see what slides they hesitated on. But if you design using something like Articulate Storyline, which is SCORM compliant, then you can track this data on your learning management system. Social learning is another concept which describes learning that happens within a community which is why you want a good discussion forum going with lots of peer support and mentoring. If you can build this into your activities and design, you'll get greater cohesion and people will learn from each other. BYOD is also a trend internationally, which stands for bring your own device. And this happens in corporations where people bring their own device and learn to the learning content management system as a third party system onto it. So it's their device, but it's the company's LMS. Chartle does this really, and we've got an app which is downloaded and an online version of Moodle so that everyone can really access learning on their own device. Pretty much gone are the days of companies supplying all devices to all learners to learn on. 
Then there's badging, which you, we use on our learning content management system for micro-credentialing and the recognition of skills which aren't part of the formal unit standards. These could be things like the CCFOs or the analytical thought and reasoning and digital literacy and emotional quotient and support given to peers during peer learning processes. Badges keep interest going in between the award of unit standards and they're becoming far more valuable particularly as our unit standards get more and more out of date. It's a good topic, in fact, for another webinar, because if we in South Africa can agree to a set of badges that we all use, they can be interchangeable and we could get industry to recognize these. And that could be good for our students. But I digress. Then there are MOOCs, which are massive open online courses. These can be free or they can be paid. And you can use these for your students and build them into your own lessons on your own LCMS. You could send people off to do a, a short MOOC on web design and then come back and do your assessment, for instance. Then there's Open Education Resources, or OER. These are shared communities of courses. They accredit materials. They're, it's open source material, if you like. Um, available to everybody who belongs to the community. And if you belong to the community, you can use these OER in your own course design. Then there's concept like crowdsource knowledge, where we all learn from each other, building our understanding as we go through sharing, pretty much like I'm doing with you now. So the world of online learning comes with a lot of different terminology. And the better we have a shared understanding of these terms, the more it is we're talking to each other and not talking past each other. I now want to explore some of the benefits to the learner of going online. And I guess this section is mainly for the SDFs, so that you can sell the benefit of online learning to your clients and to your students. But it's also for your skills development providers, because you might use this information to convince errant seaters of the ways of the modern world so that they can see the benefits of using online learning for many of their students. Firstly, the classroom is quite passive. Learners sit and listen. They're often doing other things at the time, as we know, on their phones and making shopping lists, but it's a passive experience. But online learning, in contrast, is more active. Learners actively need to engage with what's happening on the screen. They have to decide when to turn a page. They have to decide to turn a video on or turn it off or pause it or answer questions on their own. We've done research where we've had some learners in a classroom and some learners online. And at the end of the day, the learners who studied online got better competency rates than the learners who studied in a classroom. And that's because the classroom, once it's gone, it's over. You can't go back to it. You can't revisit it. And they get distracted in a classroom, whereas online, they choose when they're doing it. It's in their time and space. They can do a couple of minutes at a time and they come back to it when they need or they take a break when they need to. Classroom time is about note taking. You're literally writing down what the lecturer is saying, whereas online they have to take note of what's happening on the screen. It's a more active process. It's more active and the results result in a higher level of learning, if you know what I mean. Classroom is also a limited resource. The class time is limited time. There's a set number of days and hours for the course. But online time is unlimited. If the student doesn't understand a lesson, they simply redo it. If they need to remediate, they repeat it. The opportunity to learn is not gone forever the minute the class ends. Online learning is repeatable if they ill. It can be readily translated into another language and it's always available in their pocket on their cell if they need to review a how-to before going into an actual situation that they learned. So for instance, if you're teaching them to do performance appraisals, they'll do the lesson, they'll do the assessment, but they've got the material forever. Next time they do a performance appraisal, they can call up your lesson, revise the pros and cons of doing a performance appraisal just before they go into doing their performance appraisal. They can't call up a lecturer and get them to repeat the lecture that they had three years ago. Another disadvantage of a classroom is that it's one pace. It's the pace of the average notional hours stuff. Whereas online learning goes at the pace of each person. Some people binge it a lot like Netflix 
and then go back and repeat and do assessments. Others go more slowly and take notes as they go. Others still come in and move about the courses they want information. The pace of an online learning course is very personal, whereas classroom training simply isn't. It goes at the pace of the lecturer. Also, classroom learning is far more costly to deliver because you have to keep repeating the lessons with a different lecturer. If you've got 100 learners on a learnership, for instance, you've got at least five groups, five lecturers, five classes. Online, you develop once, and it makes no never mind if you've got 20, 200, 2,000 or 20,000 students. Cost is variable on assessments only. The rest is absolutely fixed. So classroom is far more expensive than online learning. Also, classroom is limited to one site and all students need to get there in traffic at their cost to attend their classes. Online learning can take place literally anywhere that the learner is situated and classroom learning is about the group, notional hours, average learner, etc. Online gives you a chance to deal with each learner's pace, needs and learning difficulties in a very personalised way. Just to highlight a few more benefits for learners and online learning, it's personalised in that it matches the learner's pace. As I've said, they can jump around in the content if that's what they want to do. They can keep it with them if they need to revise. But also it can be personalised to them. If they do a pre-assessment up front, if they do recognition of prior learning up front, a good learning content management system can just feed them the modules which they need to do, which can be different from what somebody else needs to do. Online learning is also easier to keep up to date, particularly if you're running classes back to back. If legislation changes, you go in, you change that module very, very quickly and the message gets out to everybody and you can send everybody an update. Online learning, depending on how it can be um, de developed, can be interactive, it can be engaging, it can be fun. You've got audio and video capability, so you, your um, different kinds of learning styles are well accommodated. You can hear, you can see, you can participate. You've also got the ability to translate fairly quickly. So if you've got a video running, you can put um, subtitles on the video. Uh, YouTube and Google Play allow you to do that now, and they are translating into English and Zulu and Tosa, and I'm sure other languages will come. That's a huge advantage for a multicultural and multi-language society like ours. You can also add additional resources on demand. So let's say that you do your assessment and a lot of people are getting a particular element, a particular unit standard wrong. You can have a look at the material you've curated. You can create a separate video or add a separate YouTube video that then just explains that point very, very quickly. You can send it out to people for their remediation. And then when they remediate, they've got up to date and additional information at their fingertips to enable them to remediate. With classroom, you've got to pull everyone in for a class, you've got to lecture, um, people have got to attend, and then they've got to away, go away and then synthesize. Online learning is far more to the point. It's often far more concise. A lot of the notional hours are taken up with extra reading and extra research, research that the learner may do. And then finally, just for the planet, online learning is a lot more eco-friendly. We're not printing trees worth of training material and paper-based portfolios and hard copy files to make the planet go into a state of shock because it has no trees left. But it's not all easy. Online learning is not all easy. There are a few challenges which I'm going to highlight for skills development providers and for SDFs who are possibly planning to choose providers to do online learning for their clients. In countries like South Africa, many students from disadvantaged groups in particular face even greater difficulty. We've got limited internet access, low broadband capacity, and all of this makes opportunities for online learning drastically constrained, especially in more rural areas. Many students from low income households and sometimes even our facilitators lack laptops or tablet computers. In addition to the digital divide challenges, many STPs will probably struggle to rapidly launch quality distance learning programs. We just don't have experienced instructional designers, sufficient educational resources, an adequate grasp of the specifics and pedagogies of online learning. And many of us don't have the strong institutional capacity to deliver it. 
In fact, very recently, the African University Association highlighted that amongst the 700 universities operating in sub-Saharan Africa, very few are well prepared and sufficiently equipped to deliver their programs online. Our own DHET recently sent out a survey to evaluate the capacity of HEIs to go online, and I'm suspecting that the results are not encouraging for the 2020 academic year. We also suffer from a lack of regulator guidance. A business model that's not suited to online learning, which I'll explore in the next section, and learners that are often not doing the learning for their own intrinsic reasons. So they lack motivation, especially if the stipend dries up. And there's just generally a lack of information sharing as SDPs in a community of practice. All of these count against us as SDPs trying to get into and onto an online learning platform quickly. I'm going to stop now for any questions. Okay, so Angelique has put a poll up on the screen. I think you guys can, can see it there. If you can have a quick, have a look at some of the, some of the questions. The first question that's posed is badging. Is badging useful in online learning? And if so, what's it for? Okay, that seems like the polling has stopped on that one. Um, so yes, badging is very useful in online learning. Um, it does all of these, all of the options are correct, so most of you got that right. It definitely is motivating because it provides interim recognition for learners. So if you're able to design your online learning with mini steps along the way, and you award a badge that people can get as some kind of recognition for each of those many steps along the way, then it does tend to keep people engaged a little more than normal. It's an element of gamification. What I'd like to see in South Africa, which is happening internationally, is some kind of collaboration on the badges so that everyone uses the same badges, the same badging standard. So if somebody comes along with a particular badge, all other skills development providers and employers actually recognize the intrinsic value in that. That would be really great. Angelique, are you going to put another question up? Okay, so second poll going on the white paper on post-school education. I'm just going to have a look at some of the questions that have come through while you're doing the mat. So Jonathan, you ask about the form of mentorship to support learners. Mentorship is absolutely critical with online learning. So it isn't a matter of just chucking material up online and hoping like hell that the learners will be self-motivated enough to do it, that they'll have the right level of interest and that they'll actually do it. They need constant guidance and mentoring to get going, to understand the technology, and even when they are, it's about the one-on-one -on -one learning conversations which support the learner through the process. Yeah, um, getting traction for something like this is can be difficult, Karen. And then somebody made a comment, SWL. 
that instead of each SDP approaching, uh, approaching the various CETAs or other agencies, would it make sense to do this as an industry, possibly with the association, um, to engage with QCTO and CETAs, et cetera, to adapt policy and process to enable online learning more broadly? It could be, it certainly would be easier than each SDP trying to, or actually even easier than each CETA trying to come up with a policy as many of them are doing at the moment. Um, I said in my presentation, which I recorded last week, that Services CETA was anti, but for those of you that are in the know, about three days ago, Services CETA announced that we can do online learning, and they even issued an online application form, so things change quickly. Okay, the question on the white paper on post-school education, yes, it is relevant to the CETAs because it's the definitive government vision for the entire post-school system. So it's relevant to CETAs, it's relevant to QCTO, it's relevant to community colleges, ABIT colleges, literally anything post-schooling, the white paper has relevance to. Okay, and then what is you learning? Ah, thanks, Stephen. Hi, Stephen. Yeah, the white paper is really a good, interesting read. It's not a recent document, but it certainly crafts the government's vision for a coherent and cohesive education system for everybody post-schooling. Yeah, Andy, if we could take that approach, possibly giving... A, a, the best policy I've seen, as I mentioned in the presentation, is the CHEs. It certainly is succinct and it talks and addresses a lot of the quality issues, which a lot of the CETAs put up as a barrier, normally around assessment. Okay, you learning, universal learning or ubiquitous learning, it's ubiquitous learning. That was, it's, it's learning that's everywhere. It's the theory that wherever we are, we're learning on whatever device we happen to be, we are learning. Di, I'm glad to hear your industry has been badging. That's fantastic. I'm just been badging against international standards for a long time. Is that the computer industry, Di? And then the next poll that's up is on asynchronous learning. What does asynchronous learning describe? Ah, uh, equestrian, Di. Okay, yes, that makes sense. The computer industry is also very, very strong with banding, with badging. The Microsoft and Oracle have badges which are fairly well accepted and fairly well recognized across the world. Thanks, Di, I'm writing that down. Okay, and asynchronous learning is the opposite of synchronous learning. Asynchronous learning, as you all say correctly, is when a lecturer and the student are not delivering and consuming the education at the same point in time. So it's a matter of the lecturer records a lecture, lecture, probably at the beginning of the year, and then they release it and the students consume it in their own time, at their own place, in their own pace. And then possibly they might have an ETUT where they're both together at the same time, which would be more synchronous learning. So yes, well done. So, um, Karen, I see what you're saying with Microsoft. Each vendor has its own brand of badge. My understanding is they've actually tried to standardize that. Uh, I was reading a report on that about six months ago. Floris, yes, if we could get the QCTO to link badging, badging to the new skills program approach, that would be quite useful. We use it with the critical crossfield outcomes because those are standard across all qualifications, but there's definitely room for the QCTO. We should speak to Diane. Okay, well done. Some nice, um, nice engagement, nice ideas coming through. 
Angelique, should we move on to the next section? Or do you have an... Okay, great. Good. Thanks very much. Thanks for your participation. I'm going to look in session two at some of the underlying pedagogies in the design of online learning. I'd like to start with a quote from Campus Source. And they say, it's argued that e-learning technology is not pedagogically neutral and that it is therefore necessary to focus on design of technology that explicitly supports a certain pedagogical approach. Further, it is argued that design should direct its focus away from organization of content and towards the design of activities. In other words, SDPs, you have to know what your pedagogy is before you choose the tech to deliver your learning. And of course, your pedagogy is going to determine how your courses are designed, what activities you've built in, what assumptions you've made about your learner and the learning environment itself. What I'm trying to say with this quote is that you can't just take your existing notes, your existing slides and throw these up onto a learning management system and say, great, now I've got online learning. You don't. You have your notes available online and you've shifted the cost of printing them to your learner. Full stop. Nothing else. You need to think about your pedagogy. Of course, we have clues. So if you're doing CETA legacy qualifications, you're looking at a mainly behavioral pedagogy. And if you're in higher education, you're mainly constructing new knowledge, so constructivist. And if you're in the QCTO framework, you're preparing people to write an ESA. OK, I'm joking, but that pretty much sums it up, sadly. We know that we have an outcomes-based education system in the CETA space, with legacy qualifications anyway. So we're told by William Spady, who really is the father of outcomes-based education, that, and I'm quoting, Outcomes-based education means clearly focusing and organizing everything in an education system around what is essential for all students to be able to do successfully at the end of their learning experience. This means starting with a clear picture of what's important for students to be able to do, and then organizing curriculum, instruction, and assessment to make sure that this learning ultimately happens. If we take this approach to OBE, our pedagogy is clear. Know what the outcomes are and build your online course to achieve the outcomes in as many ways as possible to accommodate as many learning styles as you can while building in repetition and practice. And move away from the CETA's insistence on seeing where in your notes you've covered each AC in the same order as the unit standard. They're just being lazy and they want to be able to tick off the ACs as they check your notes. Outcomes-based education isn't about this. Learning is not linear and it does not track the order of the unit standards. Online learning gives you a chance as a real STP to get to the outcomes in a creative way. And be creative. Online learning, particularly in an outcomes-based education system, is as much about the activities you design to create the learning in the individual as it is about providing the theory to scaffold the learning. Learners need to practice and practice. So when building a course for a typical unit standard, I'd advise you to look at the outcomes, divide them into knowledge, practical and workplace, and then storyboard and decide what has to be achieved and map back what knowledge, practical and workplace are needed for our, each output. Then look at the knowledge elements. Here you'll use design strategies like possibly articulate storyline or voice over PowerPoint or video or just readings. Mix it up and repeat the knowledge information. Then the more exciting part is to create the activities. And here you identify the doing word. And I would recommend what works for me anyway, is to link it to something like Bloom's hierarchy. I came up with this model when I was doing some research. No, I didn't come up with the model, I found this model. They call it a padology, a padology wheel. And it's to create learning activities using various apps that exist already. So, for instance, the apps here in green can all be used to create understanding. If you're looking at Bloom's hierarchy and you're just looking at doing understanding stuff. The apps all highlighted in purple are to get learners to create things. 
The apps in blue are apps that can be used to evaluate things. The apps in yellow are there to analyze. And the red are apps to apply their learning in different contexts. So if you use a model like this, it helps you to create many diverse and practical activities as possible to help your learners cement their learning. Once you know this, you choose your technology to deliver according to your pedagogy and your model for learning and your learner's agency and of course what they have available. And the more you mix it up and the more you use different apps and the more you use different exciting activities, the more engaged your learners are going to be in the learning process. Learning then becomes fun, far more than sitting in a classroom being told by somebody how it is. To summarize then, I just want to look at a few technical design considerations when you're designing your e-learning. You need to say to yourself, what learning are you trying to create? Is it a fair mix of knowledge and practical and workplace without being too much workplace, like possibly forklift driving? If you're training forklift drivers, for instance, look at a flipped classroom, do your knowledge component online, possibly use a simulation for the practical, but you still need a workplace and a real forklift to train a proper forklift driver. So the extent that you can use online learning really depends on the learning that you're trying to create. You need to know who your learners are. You need to understand their learner agency. You need to know if they're digitally aware, aware enough to be able to cope online. Are they going to be accepting of online? Do they see online learning as beneficial? Or do they really just want to go to a classroom so that they get a meal and sticky buns at tea time? You need to, as well, understand your learner's attitude towards the training. Do they want to learn? They have to be self-motivated to learn online. A classroom learning environment almost drags people along because they get caught in the, I don't know, the storm of being cajoled along by their peers and it's regular enforced attendance. Online left to their own devices, if they don't have a level of intrinsic motivation, they're probably not going to be engaged. And your learners need to have a level of digital literacy. We train most of our learners up front on a digital literacy program and we make sure that they have access. We make sure that they understand how the computer works, that they understand how to download an app onto their smartphone, that they have access to Wi-Fi, and that they can get onboarded by the phone, because we phone everybody, so that they can be onboarded and taken through the program to start. You need to know what type of internet access and devices your learners typically have. As a general rule of thumb, a download speed of 2 megabits per second is recommended if you're going to be using video or SCORM compliant um, e-learning such as what you might develop in Articulate Storyline. Understand as well how supportive your CETA is of e-learning. Will you do this possibly and get your application for accreditation rejected? It's a good idea to have the conversation with them up front. And then understand what you have already. Do you have notes? Do you have videos? Do you have the skill to convert what you've got meaningfully to an online learning methodology? Because if you don't, it's going to cost you a lot of money and that may not be what you need right now. You need to ask yourself how you're going to deliver this learning. Are you going to invest in a learning content management system like we did with Moodle? Or are you just going to put video up on the internet, create yourself a YouTube channel, for instance, and rely on video and one-on-one -on -one calls with your learners? Both of those work if that's what you have access to. And then don't discount webinars like this. Um, you pre-record, have the question and answer or the discussion session in between sections. You've got a combination of synchronous and asynchronous in a methodology like this. You've also got to know how you're going to support your learner because making courses available online is simply not enough. Yes, they need to be fit for purpose, but they need to be supported personally. And we have an entire student support hub that call our learners on an ongoing basis. The last consideration when it comes to going online is how much money and how much time do you have? If it's just the next two weeks of lockdown and you think we're going to be out of here by the beginning of May, it may not be worth the investment, particularly if you then plan to be back in a classroom quickly and you've discussed that with your clients. If you need a short term quick fix solution, I would recommend going with a quick solution like webinars and a YouTube channel 
just to get this up and running and tide yourself over. But if you really believe this is the new way, then I would recommend that you try and find a learning content management system and that you play a bit new experiment and you practice and you get ready for this new paradigm shift in education, which is definitely coming. I think anyway. I'll take a few questions before we move on to the next section, the final section. OK, so a few questions have come through. One of them from Karen, and I, I found Karen that I can't type answers to the chat at the same time as um, playing the video because it stops. Are all these apps free? Most of them are free, and there are many more since that pedagogical um, wheel since I first saw it about 12, weeks, 12 months ago. So there are many, many different kinds that you can experiment with. Yes, we do digital literacy online. We pretty much say that most of the students who start with us should start with digital literacy or at least do the assessment on digital literacy before they actually start engaging with the online content. Uh, Jonathan, another consideration in the case of a learnership, how committed is to the employer to be involved and support the learners? Yeah, that's the age-old question and whether we're doing the learning online or whether we're doing the learning in a classroom, you've probably got the same. So in a situation like that where the employer isn't absolutely engaged, maybe you do flip it and you do the theory online and you bring them into the classroom for some simulation, at least if the workplace is not cooperating. Hi, Michelle. What's the one thing you'd suggest someone who is brand new to online learning to read or to do? I think the best thing to do, Michelle, is to actually sign up for a free online course. There are many of them out there at the moment. There's even a few on our website. Um, you could do a course on entrepreneurship, Michelle. Um, and just get a feel of how, it, how you experience it from a learner's perspective. Once you, for yourself, understand how you experience it, then it's a, a nice in to questioning what you would do differently if you were the course designer, and then you can start to have a look at how it might work. There are also a number of resources that are being made available by some of the universities at the moment. And if you drop me an email, Michelle, I'll send you some of those links. The CHE sent them through to us yesterday. So a lot of the universities like UJ, et cetera, have, are starting to get some online resources for facilitators and assessors. The question that's up on the board, OBE does not lend itself to online learning optimally because no reason, the focus on outcomes make it absolutely perfect. And that's on, on, absolutely the answer. Outcomes-based education does lend itself to online learning. And that's one of the more frustrating things about some of the seaters in their resistance to allowing us to do it. Angelique, do you have another question there? Ah, you do. Online learning can include, and there's a number of options there. Okay, so there's a poll on the screen, if you can see that. Online learning can include, and ah, there we go. There's a couple of options. Okay, so most of you said that online learning would include videos, e-learning, webinars, readings, and third-party URLs. The new concept with ubiquitous learning is really that any online content can be classified as online learning. 
And that's all that's important is really where it's stored, in other words, that it's stored online, but that it's also consumed through online means. And that's really the underpinning with ubiquitous learning. And it's the theory of saying maybe we don't even need to curate content for people anymore. Maybe for mature learners anyway, we just give them the outcomes and we let them do the investigation and come up with the learning, which is what some providers like Let's Go Code that's what they do. Let's learn code, sorry. Okay, and then another question. If your learners are not digitally literate, what options do you have? Carl, you're saying, so will all ETQA, uh, assessors and moderators, etc., need to upskill knowledge to enable them to assess accurately? Not quite sure I understand the question. Will all assessors and moderators need to upskill knowledge to enable them to assess accurately. Hmm. Kind of hoping we are assess accurate, assessing accurately at the moment. But it, you've got in brackets big data. One of the big skill shifts that a lot of our online faculty have grappled with is that, okay, they were faculty beforehand, so they used to train in a classroom. Now their classroom is the online environment and they have to learn new skills. And one of those new skills is being able to access big data. Belinda, you're saying technical leaderships can be challenges, especially if the learners are blue collar workers, limited computer literacy and access to a tool like a computer, absolutely. So in an environment where people just don't have access or the lower level um, unit standards and qualifications are more difficult, but even in every single legacy qualification, we have a situation where each unit standard is made up of knowledge and practical and reflexive components. So e-learning can be used for all of the knowledge components. And then if you flip it, your face-to-face -face interaction with learners is with them already having the knowledge because they've done it online, and then they come into the classroom and they practice. Okay, the question on the screen was exactly that. If your learners aren't digitally literate, what options do you have? Train them to be digitally literate as a value add, yes, and that's exactly what we do. Um, 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 Karen, LMSs that are responsive, can we use on a mobile phone? Yes, you can. So Moodle, which is what we use at Charter Business College, has an app. It's not that easy to set up, but it is possible. So our learners are able to access all of their learning material on the app on their phone and then they disconnect from the internet and then they consume their learning offline and then they go back on and they, they upload their results. Question on the screen, learner agency is important when contemplating online learning because if our learners aren't self-motivated there's less chance that they will engage online. Yep. Okay, Angelique, I think that was the last um, qu ah, question. If there are no more questions, I'm going to see if I can then get us all going into the third, third and last section of the presentation. This is session three, and here I've posed the question, if getting online is right for me and my learners or clients, how do we do it? At this point, though, I'd like to say that internationally, the move to online education has not been universally embraced, just even though we're in COVID-19 and lockdown. For example, Argentina's biggest university in Buenos Aires has postponed classes and they've rearranged the academic calendar rather than switch to online. They've decided that only in-person courses can guarantee quality. Also, the National University of Science and Tech in Zim has announced that they are going to remain closed to further notice, as did the Malaysian Ministry of Higher Education, which literally suspended online education and on-campus activities when COVID broke out there. In some, some countries, students are also resisting the digital transition. So in Tunisia, the main student union has denounced the government's decision to adopt online learning during COVID-19. And they have called the move discriminatory and they've called for a boycott of online platforms. The same has happened in Chile, where students at the country's main public university, as well as the biggest private one, have initiated online strikes. And even in the United Kingdom, 
more than 200,000 students have signed a petition demanding refunds of their tuition payments, essentially claiming that online instruction isn't what they paid for. So just because we think it's a solution, our stakeholders might not universally see it as such. And we need to consider our staff, our students, our clients and our regulators. And all need to agree with our move online, especially here in South Africa, because we've got limited and unequal distribution of bandwidth, data is expensive, and private providers are not being given the same benefit as public providers to zero rate their websites and learning platforms for online learning. As a side note, I think this is highly discriminatory. And basically, the Vodacom MTNs and Telcoms, etc., are discriminating against the students who have chosen to study through private providers as if their choice of a provider makes them less worthy of support to keep studying. But that's a discussion for another day, and I hope that our representative bodies take up the unfairness of this as soon as possible. The South African Private Higher Education Association has already done so, this I know. Okay, but let's assume your learners want it, and you think it's the way to go, and your CETA agrees and your clients agree, and you have enough time, expertise, and you've got money to start it to get started, what would I recommend you do? So as I said in the beginning, we made this move about five years ago. And these are some of the decisions that I grappled with when we made the move to be an online provider. The first lesson that I learned was that once I'd crafted my new strategy, I realized that we had to be one or the other. Being half face-to-face -face and half online simply doesn't work. It's different assessment tools, it's different um, learning materials, it's different staff capabilities. In fact, to be both is more expensive and it means you do neither well. Most of all, you're held back by your staff and your business model though. So for example, in our face-to-face -face learning paradigm five years ago, we had full-time project managers and this is not unusual for private skills development providers. These full-time project managers manage the clients, they set class dates, they manage learner attendance and paperwork, etc., etc. And then we had part-time facilitators and assessors who were scheduled by the project managers. All of this is good for face-to-face -face learning. It's a tried and tested model that works, but it doesn't translate into good online learner support and learning. The project managers, by their very nature and training, are not academic. They can't help with a quick academic question, and their key drivers with online learners is the same as with their face-to-face -face learners. So it's more punitive. If you don't attend, you didn't submit, um, we call you and we monitor you, basically, and we set new deadlines and we cajole. It's not motivational. If an academic question came up, the project managers couldn't deal with it, so they had to call academic staff to answer queries. And of course, dealing with invoicing of the part-time facilitators who wanted to invoice for one or two questions a day was tricky. It simply didn't work. So after much pain and some retraining and retrenchments, we now have full-time academic faculty of assessors and facilitators and part-time project managers for the limited admin associated with some online courses, especially our learnerships and our big groups. It's a very different business model. You need full-time academic staff to coach on demand and make short videos when you see learners battling with specific concepts. You need just-in-time support. It's a completely different model. Then our pedagogy changed. We're far more micro-learning focused now. We tend to develop short videos on single topics and we mix and match them to make bigger courses. A bit like taking chapters out of a single book and combining them with other chapters to make new books. So to facilitate this, we have a library on our learning content management system and we can select bits of learning to add to new courses. It's a different pedagogy completely. We don't sit down and write notes for one course. We take a building block approach and we create knowledge bytes and then we mix and match these knowledge bytes to create new short courses or qualifications. We at Chartle made the decision to go with the learning content management system and we invested a great deal of time developing Moodle. It is open source. It's the biggest learning management system in the world. It's got a 50% market share. It's very stable, it's free. It's not related to um, any one company. So you're not dependent on a single company's survival. And there are literally thousands of tech guys around the world collaborating and adding um, 
uh, and doing fixes. They also have free open education resources courses that you can build into your own courses if you want to. But if you're dabbling, don't invest in a learning content management system. It can be time consuming. It's free, but it does take time to set up. I'll share a few ideas on the next slide. Or you could even just set yourself up with a YouTube channel. You can't monitor and track um, how long people have spent on a course, but if time is short, setting up a YouTube channel is definitely a solution that will work. Assessment is a big decision. As a higher education provider, we do online proctoring of our exams, but e-portfolios are available and we use that for Bank CETA. We also do online assessment via Moodle for some summatives and formatives, particularly for our short courses. But I know of providers who would accept an email portfolio in PDF, who then assess it by adding ticks and comments on that PDF and email it back for remediation and then get it back again. They then print for any backward CETA that they're dealing with who wants a paper-based portfolio. So really adjust your methodology to whatever works for your situation. You also need to think about your delivery mode. Are you going to go synchronous, same time delivery and consumption like a live e-tutorial? Or are you going to go asynchronous with pre-recorded videos or a combination like this webinar even? Then the secret to rapid course development is to create. Now this is a process of putting together stuff from different sources, learning artifacts they cause them call them. So in our case at Chartle, we use some of our own videos. We've got our own videographer, our own video studio, our own editing capability. But we also have our own notes. But in addition to that, we borrow and obviously we acknowledge from YouTube and um, sites like TED Talks. We curate content from other books, from articles, from we share URLs with our students. We'll look at MOOCs. Um, we'll have a look at many, many, many other sites or bytes of knowledge and we combine all this together. We, we curate it properly. So it's not just a matter of a mesh of stuff loaded onto the LMS. It's all signboarded and um, storyboarded to make sense to learners. But it's, we make up a rich course from various sources. It does take time, but it's valuable for learners to be exposed to various narratives. Most of all, when it comes to going online, you need a support mechanism. You need to support your learners. This can be done, again, through multiple means. The discussion forum on the LMS is a good way of doing it. WhatsApp groups is another way of doing it. There are many, many different ways of supporting your learners. I've got to say that having great online material is simply not enough. You still need the personal touch and probably you need more of a personal touch than you would if you were in a classroom environment. You've got to motivate. You've got to keep people committed. and You've got to keep your learners learning. The Chartle model is simple. We have a learning management system. As I said, it's, it's Moodle um, and it's open source. We have apps for offline learning and mobile learning. Um, and this image really is a, an image of our app on a phone. So people can download the app from the App Store. They can download all their online learning material. Then they can go offline and they can consume it. They can do their quizzes. And then when they next connect, it uploads all the SCORM data so that we can track the learners. We've gone with a combination of synchronous and asynchronous learning to motivate and allow us to track our learners. We use Flip Classroom um, with an element of face-to-face. -face. So they do the theory online and then they do practicals and role plays and case studies, etc. in class. We use a lot of apps. They write blogs, they create videos, they do role plays, they record presentations. Um, they upload all of these to Moodle if they're part of their assessments. We mostly use video for our course development. As I said, it's chunked into micro learning. We do occasionally use Articulate Storyline and third-party content. We used to be all Articulate Storyline, but we've definitely moved on from that because video is a lot, lot faster to actually get published and out. We redesigned all our notes. We use dynamic documents, so they're hyperlinks um, that open into new worlds of information and videos. So somebody goes through a subject guide, click on something, it takes them to a video explaining concept, and then they come back. We use MCQs as formative and simulations. 
Um, we've got definitions, we've got um, translated words. The options with the learning content management system really are endless. We do e-tutorials via Zoom or MS Teams or Skype or even WhatsApp. And as I've said, our assessments, we use an e-portfolio, editable Word document, um, embedded assessments into Moodle, all that kind of thing. The final thing that's been a success for us at Chartal is that all faculty are trained. We've customized the ND ODE to DP into an online, into a course for online delivery to train online assessors, online facilitators, online course developers, etc. We train them as part of the OD qualification to set up an LMS to develop videos. We, we explain the basics of online pedagogy. In fact, I'm trying to get funding for 300 people to do this to build capacity for SDPs in the sector. So if you're interested, do let me know. I am approaching various CETAs and MPOs, and it could be a course for all of us that changes how we think as a sector. So what would I recommend to me if I was in your shoes as a face-to-face -face SDP right now? I'd say don't be hasty. Some of you have qualifications, some of you have got CETAs, learners and clients that can migrate online fairly quickly, but others it's not going to be that easy. I want you to play it by ear and I suggest you work on your strategy first. Don't have a knee-jerk reaction and spend money rushing online if you don't need to. You could start off by being a tenant to an existing STP's LMS like ours at Chartle Business College, but this can be costly to set up and it really only works if you've got a number of courses to look at. We are doing this for some clients with a combination of our own courses and learnerships and their internal courses like induction, etc. But it's a more expensive option. A less expensive way is to test it by looking at existing commercial platforms that help you take your courses online. Look at pay to use sites like thinkific.com, learnworlds.com and teachable.com. These are just three. Um, these are sites where you can load a course, you rent a space for about $30 a month and here you can test whether it's for you. They run the whole e-commerce setup for you and they might charge you a small fee per enrollment. It's a very quick way to get online to see if this works for you. In fact, way back, this is how I tested our model in the very, very beginning. And then don't forget the non-trackable online learning. Zoom, simple webinars like this one, and setting up a YouTube channel. Chartle Business College has got a YouTube channel, and our entire generic management for material developed in Articulate Storyline, the old way we did things, is on there as an example. It's all free, but if somebody wants to use it, they can. Um, if somebody wants to get the formal credentials, they would simply pay for assessment. It's just another way to create awareness and deliver. And having your own YouTube channel shows your name and shows your face and showcases your ability and your brand. And the reality is that that's the entity your clients know and trust. You can also, in a pinch, just email notes um, and chat to learners on WhatsApp or Zoom, etc. If your learners are motivated to learn, they will. So having a learning content management system and spending that money is really not the only way that you can tackle this problem. I've gone on a bit, but I really just want to summarize. Based on many reports from STP struggling with the sudden shift to online education, a few considerations are urgently important for institutions engaged in the transition. Firstly, you need to align learning and assessment pedagogies with a new online curriculum and pedagogical approach. Designing online training and assessment methods to fit these emerging models of teaching and learning will take significant effort. We know that, but it will help to assure the quality of learning and the validity of your final assessments. Secondly, you have to know your learners and your clients and design to meet their needs. This is not about you and your survival alone. Third, institutions must establish, increase or strengthen academic and psychological support for today's students and faculty. Don't forget faculty. Both are going to battle. And at Chartle, I still have faculty who are resistant and would rather be in the classroom. This is even more crucial as growing numbers of students and faculty struggle to adjust to new teaching and learning approaches, not to mention their fears and concerns about the pandemic. 
careful reliance on data from a SCORM compliant LMS with predictive analytics and student retention staff can help support staff identifying and struggling to identify their students early on. And this can help us pinpoint the areas in which these students require extra support. At Charter, we have a dedicated student retention manager. Think about that role for a while. Definitely a role that didn't exist five years ago when I was a face-to-face -face SDP. But now, with 4,200 students online, as we had in 2019, this role is new. It's a very valuable job role and we've taken on, that we've taken on board, and it's showing brilliant returns. Fourth, all STPs must factor this crisis into their strategic planning, undertaking through risk assessment and mitigation processes to anticipate the medium and long-term consequences of the pandemic, including our expected economic recession. For STPs in South Africa, this COVID crisis can be a moment to activate a few deep partnerships with other providers, whether they're public or private that are willing to share their resources and experience during the emergency, especially in these areas of digital education. Partnerships can be rewarding, notably for online learning. I know that I've gone on a bit, but if you have any questions about the last... Okay, so a few questions came in while I was doing that. And as I explained, I was not able to actually answer these um, while the video was playing. So I'm going to go back and answer some of them because I think they're quite useful. And um, we started with Jonathan. Given that our CETA's employers, DHEAD, QCTO and learners are not 100% ready for the switch, does it mean that we should maybe start with a hybrid system of online and face-to-face -face for the transitional period? Yes, I absolutely agree with you, Jonathan. That's blended, the, the blended um, delivery model, um, flipped classroom where you get people to do the theory online and then they come into the classroom with the theory knowledge, which then allows you to spend more time on practical activity to actually cement and build the learning. So I think a hybrid system is a good idea, um, particularly at some of the, the lower levels where you've got maybe more practical than, than you do have theory. Debbie, you asked uh, estimates on the cost of online learning uh, for level four, I'm not quite sure if you mean to actually deliver it or if you mean to develop it. So to develop it, we're probably looking in the region of about 180, 200,000. Um, to deliver it, what we would charge the students, um, an individual would be about 11,000 Rand. So it's a lot to get going, but once you've got it, it's replicable and you can keep repeating it. I hope that answers your question. So in D-Swear, with the shift to online learning, there'll obviously be a shift in the skills needs within the workplace. Yes, um, that's obviously true. A lot of companies are starting to push the fourth industrial revolution agenda with skill sets and digital literacy is a big part of that. Skills for the virtual world. Uh, I think if you're talking about OD practitioners, lots, because they not only need the ability to run an LMS, to have a look at the data, to use the data to identify at-risk learners, to then communicate with at-risk learners and have the learning conversations remotely that we used to have in the classroom. So I think for OD practitioners, the shift to online is definitely bringing many, many different skill sets. As to income generating ideas that could be considered in support of these skills, I'm not quite, I think we might have to take that one offline. I'm not quite sure off the top of my head. Mari, you say you mentioned the decision coupled with the money to start the process. Can you indicate the approach principles that one should apply when determining a costing model? If you're looking at costing to develop your online learning, the first step is really to decide what your pedagogy is, what you're going to be doing online, if it's just the knowledge or if you're going to try and simulate some of the practical as well. If you're looking at trying to simulate some of the practical, then you're developing those simulated exercises, things like in-basket exercises or random role plays or engagements with the computer, and that can be a lot more expensive. But if your pedagogy is, like Jonathan said, simply to do the knowledge online, and to use a simple approach of maybe video or articulate storyline, 
then it's not as expensive when you are looking at costing the development of online learning. And a few people asked about the OD course. Floris, your idea and, and your comment was meaningful to me. You asked if I'd looked at customizing the, ETD, uh, the QCTO's occupational trainer qualification instead of doing the ETD practitioner. I have, and I do like the QCTO's qualification. It's just about three months ago, we applied for accreditation for one qualification and we've had a site visit, but we still haven't had any feedback from the QCTO. So I think that process is quite slow and quite laborious. The other reason I would look at ETDPs is that it could be done as a learnership. And if it's done as a learnership, then obviously companies can claim triple BEE points as well as possible learnership funding which we can't do with the QCTO at the moment. So it's a funding issue, but it's certainly something I'd like to explore with you if you have any ins there for me. A few people asking about the OD qualification, I'll chat to Angelique about that with the association and see if we can put something together for everybody. But I was envisaging and what I'm trying to get funding for is for the level five certificate. Um, thank you very much, Stephen. Yes, I'm definitely happy to share. Okay. <laughs> um, terms of pricing, Kerry, um, for online learning, is the perception truth that it's cheaper than the classroom? There is definitely that perception that it's cheaper than the classroom. And I think, look, look certainly in our costing model, it is cheaper than the classroom. Um, because we don't have that, that need to have a facilitator travel to a classroom that we've got a book. It is cheaper. However, the development of the course for online delivery is absolutely, it is more expensive. So it's more expensive to develop an online course than it is to develop a paper-based course. But once you've got it, the delivery of it, because you're not paying the classroom facilitator every single day that they're standing up there is cheaper to deliver. So I think it's swings and roundabouts. Okay, so Chantal, Jean-Marie saying you're interested in the OD. Let me do that through the Institute and see if there's something that we can pick up there. Thank you for your interest. I also thought it would be quite a nice idea. So if we can do that, then good. Karen, anyone keen to workshop creating and designing online qualifications as a learning experience? It's definitely something that I would look at and again, happy to share. Um, we could possibly even link it if people wanted to, to one of the ETDP unit standards and see if there was a possibility for, for funding or just to debate, happy to help. Okay, and then I had a question up on the screen, which was curation. So curation, um, collection of a variety of different learning artifacts to deliver online is absolutely correct. So what we do when we develop online courses is we don't just develop per AC, as I tried to explain, it's less of a linear process and we would pull bits of information from different places. So whereas in the past the OD practitioner was a developer of content because everything they developed they created with curation it's more finding content that supports your learning objectives and pulling it from a variety of different sources and making that available for your learners to explore okay another question up on the screen online learning can be used for all options can be delivered online absolutely we can do learnerships online, we can do recognition of prior learning online, skills programs, absolutely everything can be done online. Okay. Okay, creating and designing an online qualification, few people interested there. So possibly that's something Angelique that the association could pick up as a separate possibility. Uh, yeah, that's perfect, absolutely. I'm very prepared to help. Some of you do know where to find me. Um, but maybe it's a good idea if we do it through the association, then, then if I do a frequently asked questions from everybody, we can then circulate it to everybody thereafter and everyone can keep learning. So good. Um, thank you very much for your thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. I'm glad you enjoyed it and I'm glad you found it um, informative. Good. Great.
It's a pleasure, Angelique. Thank you for inviting me. Cool. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Amal. And thanks for being so responsive. <laughs>